there. I'm Chuck Todd, and welcome to another episode of Meet the Press Reports. Misinformation comes in all languages, but there's growing evidence that the misinformation crisis is most acute for one group in particular in this country, Latinos. The most recent Pew Research study found that Hispanic adults are more likely to use YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, and WhatsApp, the Facebook-owned private messaging service. They use it more than white and black Americans. In fact, nearly half of Latinos are on WhatsApp, compared to just a quarter of the general population. And not only are Latinos more likely to have social media accounts, they're also spending more time on the platform than anyone else. And that brings us to the real problem. It lies in the content they're reading. The fact is you're more likely to encounter misinformation online if you're Latino and speak Spanish than if you're white and speak English. And as Morgan Radford reports, while social media platforms like Facebook are expanding Spanish language fact-checking, the impact on the Latino community is already evident. Susie Calderon doesn't trust the mainstream media. I don't believe in the vaccines. You do not believe in the vaccines? No. What do you believe they will do to you? I think the vaccine has a lot of um, chemicals and they can damage your, your body in the long run. And from where she's sitting, things are getting worse. It's like they're taking away our rights. You can talk normally. You have a mask in your face, people see half of your face. What are some of the things you think that the mainstream media is getting wrong? Well, this information, they want us to not to talk. They don't want us to say the truth. Susie came from Cuba in the 1980s. Her daughter, Amore Rodriguez, worries that the government propaganda her mom experienced in Cuba is coloring her perception of what factual information looks like here. It concerns me that truth doesn't exist anymore. Which is part of the reason she started this group. Uh, materials, sign up list, graphics. Of like-minded Cuban Americans concerned about the information their families are getting here at home. Do you think there is misinformation within the Latino community? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? <laughs> 110%. Oh my God. I mean, it's everywhere. Not only misinformation, but disinformation targeted specifically Spanish language and the Latino community. It's a belief backed up by national research, with more than a third of Hispanic Americans saying they see misinformation often online. According to one analysis by activist group Avaz, nearly 70% of misinformation in Spanish went unlabeled by Facebook, compared to less than 30% of misinformation in English. By a show of hands, how many of you have personally received misinformation? <laughs> All of you. Yeah. yeah. Where did it come from? Our tias, our primos, our abuelas. De todos. Everybody. Yes. Besides COVID, what else are you seeing? What other types of misinformation is out there? I've seen misinformation on the election. Democrats stole the election. You know, Antifa was the one that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Did it work? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We didn't just see it in the Cuban community, which we represent, but we saw it in the Venezolano community, in the Nicaragüense community. And it works because the trauma is real, right? The misinformation mm -hmm. is fake, but the trauma is very That's real. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what it is, is if anything, it makes it so sad to see our family's yeah. trauma be exploited. When your family shares this type of misinformation with you, what do you say? I personally hit back immediately. <laughs> I review it. I make sure I fact check myself. We're literally living in two different realities. I came home one day and my sister was like, girl, did you hear? I was like, what happened? She said, Hillary Clinton's dead. And I was like, what? So I picked up my phone. I was on Twitter. I was trying to find it. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, they killed her in Guantanamo. And I'm like, why? She's like, because she's kidnapping Haitian kids and all this stuff. And I was like, who told you this? She's like, abuela. And I'm like... So your sister told you your grandma said this? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's a phenomenon that's having real-world effects. In Florida, 40% of Cuban Americans say they don't believe President Joe Biden was legitimately elected. And given that Latinos spend more time on social media than their non-Hispanic white counterparts, it's a problem that's not going away. But it's not just happening in Florida. 
In Texas, Democratic strategists are sounding the alarm about a wave of misinformation aimed at Latinos heading into 2022. Vote red. Information Tony Torres receives firsthand. Can you show me where you get your information on? Yeah, like, uh, okay. This is Telegram, this, yeah. Alex Jones, Proud Boys. These are just different news sources. Torres is a Latino voter in the Rio Grande Valley who wears a shirt to show he opposes President Biden which saw one of the biggest rightward shifts in the country from 2016 to 2020. He says the information he receives online directly impacts how he votes, especially with so much competing information about the pandemic. I've never been tested. I've never been vaccinated. I'm not afraid of it. So you've never been tested? I've never been tested. I'll, I'll never get tested. Why? Because I don't want that thing down my nose because, because I heard now that they're, they're taking your DNA. Do you believe in? You, wait, you heard they're taking your DNA yes. when they swipe you for COVID tests? Yes. I have never heard that. Yeah. Where did you I, hear that? I heard that from Alex Jones. An epidemic of misinformation that some are tracking in real time. Here's one, for example, claiming the vaccine has a microchip, still up, no label. It's all in Spanish. Jacobo Licona is a misinformation researcher at X Labs. His job to track down and flag some of the biggest pieces of Spanish language misinformation making the rounds online. It's a big problem because what we see is that the Latino community specifically when it comes to Spanish language disinformation is consuming information from both hemispheres. During the November 2020 election, for example, there was a lot of voter fraud narrative spreading, false information. The English content was being labeled or getting removed or having a fact check while the Spanish content either was taking days to get labeled or never getting labeled at all. But where is it coming from? According to a Washington Post analysis, much of the misinformation spread uncontested or was even outright weaponized by those opposed to Joe Biden. Other sources include some Spanish language media, private WhatsApp channels and other social media. A problem he says social media companies like Facebook have failed to fix. Given that what they said and showing concerns about the 2020 election, showing concerns about what was spreading around the pandemic and vaccines, it's clear that they have research looking into it, but aren't taking the appropriate actions after that. But not all misinformation comes through social media. For example, for many Latino voters like here in South Florida, it comes through a much more old fashioned way, like through the airwaves of their AM radio. Julio Ligorria and Juan Camilo Gomez host a radio show at Actualidad 1040 AM. Is there a lot of misinformation within the Latino community here? <laughs> yes. That much, huh? Yes. One of the top AM Spanish language stations in South Florida, the station and its top competitor, Radio Mambi, reaching nearly 300,000 daily listeners combined, both of which were the subjects of a new study done by a mix of nonpartisan and progressive groups in South Florida, accusing them of spreading misinformation and disinformation to Florida's Latino community. Among the examples, that 42,000 people in Nevada voted more than once, and that Black Lives Matter members took part in the January 6th attacks. It's the type of misinformation that Ligoria and Gomez try to tackle themselves. How much time do you all spend personally combating misinformation? We do it so much that we end up having an actual segment combating misinformation in the show. Do you think that people who aren't hispanohablantes, people who don't speak Spanish, understand the severity or the scale of this problem? No, they, they don't. The English-speaking market has nothing to do with what is happening with the Spanish-speaking market. Creating a political divide across the country that Amore and her mother say they hope to avoid at home. So how does this work? I mean, what does the future look like if families can't agree on what is true and what is false? We make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we talk Una about it. bien cubana. Yeah. <laughs> A very Cuban answer. We, no, I, I, we have to rely on God. That God is going to make things possible. So I don't lose my hope that things are, can get better. A big thank you to my colleague, NBC News' Morgan Radford, for that report. Uh, NBC News reached out to Facebook and WhatsApp's parent company, Meta, for comment on this report. And here is part of their response. We're running our entire strategy on misinformation in Spanish. We remove Spanish language voter interference content and false claims about COVID-19 and vaccines. And we connect people with authoritative information in Spanish through our voting and COVID-19 information centers. 
Joining me now is a panel of experts in the spread of misinformation. Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Carmen Sassin, a reporter for NBC News Latino, who's based in Miami. She once worked for the state-owned Russian television network, RT, a long time ago. And Ben Dubo, who founded Omulus, a firm that tracks digital propaganda. Carmen, I want to start with you. You live in my hometown, and I was monitoring Miami-Dade County, ele the electorate, very closely because of how important it is in how the state goes. And for the, for the six months before the election day in 2020, that's all I heard. Hey, you have no idea what's happening in Spanish-language media. Spanish-language talk radio is this, you know, be careful here. Biden's not doing so hot. Da-da-da-da-da. Is, th is this all part of it? It's impossible to tell how much the disinformation had to do with the sway of votes towards Trump. Mm -hmm. um, did it have an effect on people? Absolutely. I was out on election day, I spoke to voters, and people did mention conspiracy theories, things that were just false on election day as I was interviewing them. But Trump also spent a lot of time campaigning in Florida. So did Vice President uh, Mike Pence. Uh, John Bolton gave very important foreign policy All throughout the term. That's exactly, exactly right. No, they were working the issue, the larger issues of Venezuela right. in particular. So it's difficult to say if that, if that shift towards Trump was, you know, just because of disinformation or a combination of things. You have Venezuela and Ben, you were saying the, the, the state media in Venezuela is very aggressive. Explain. And how much help do they get from the Russians? Yeah, so we track uh, the online presence of the most influential newspapers, TV channels, government officials around the world, including in Latin America. And what we see is that the Venezuelan government, through VTV8, through Telesor TV, which they own in partnership with uh, Cuba and Nicaragua, uh, their online output is just massive. So while there's probably some knowledge sharing with Russia, Venezuela really has built this up on their own. Uh, because these are Venezuelan stations, of course, they mostly appeal to Venezuelans um, as a whole. But because they have such a large presence and because really uh, anybody from anywhere who speaks Spanish can interact with this content, they're able to exercise just massive influence throughout the Spanish-speaking world. Imran, you... Look, you're, you're, you have started an organization trying to deal with digital hate. So you've been interacting with the social media companies in particular. Um, they're struggling in English. Explain how they're doing in Spanish and in other languages. Well, it's one of the things I always say is if you think they're doing a bad job in English, just wait till you see it in Spanish, in Urdu, in Hindi, in the, in the languages of the world, in Ukrainian uh, and in Russian right now. And I, I think one of the problems is that they failed not just to moderate the content and to put labels, for example. They've also failed to take down the biggest accounts that are dis disinforming people on those platforms. Mm -hmm. Take Joe McCullough, for example, one of the, the, the leading anti-vaxxer in the United States right now. His channel specifically targeting Spanish language people on Facebook has a million followers. He's still able to transmit misinformation on Instagram on a whole array of channels available to him. The same is true with the other ones. One of the things that is noticeable, though, is that quite a lot of these bad actors that are targeting the Spanish-speaking world, they're actually Americans. Mm -hmm on American platforms. Mm. I mean, the rest of the world sees this as an American disease that America's really failing to catch up with. It, it, uh, Carmen, you were, it was interesting what Morgan found. I, I thought it was interesting that the, the daughter in the piece made the case, well, look, my, my mom came from a totalitarian place, Cuba. So there's already this uh, skepticism there. So it doesn't take much to convince somebody who lived in a place that had state-controlled media and wasn't telling you the truth, that, oh, well, maybe all governments are like that. And that is, there, is, is that what you're finding when you see it anecdotally down in Miami? Yeah, absolutely. I think it takes a different toll on Latinos who have fled um, author authoritarian regimes like in Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, um, definitely. And two patterns that I've seen since I started tracking this information is that there's stuff that's translated from English to Spanish, like QAnon, but there's an enormous amount of content that comes from Latin America, and it makes its way to Miami, to Florida, mm -hmm. through uh, social media, through closed messaging apps like WhatsApp, like uh, Telegram. Um, and sometimes you find that Russia may have had something to do with it. Um, recently, I was on a, a, a press briefing with the National Security Council mm -hmm. uh, before the president of Colombia visited with, with Biden, and right. they mentioned that Colombia was extremely concerned over the amount of disinformation being directed from Russia into Colombia. 
Okay, that using Venezuela. Uh, no, you, directly, just directly, directly okay. from Russia into Colombia. Yeah. Colombia is very polarized right now. They have presidential elections next year. All that disinformation makes its way here. The first piece of disinformation I ever saw mm -hmm. that someone I know sent to me was a Colombian supposed political analyst yeah. talking about Biden and, and China. Ben, is this what you're? I mean, is is the source? Or, or is the is the true source truly Russia in almost every case? Or at least like they're the seed planter, I guess, if you would. So propaganda is really only effective in so much as it can play on what's already there, in so much as it can conform to the pre-existing beliefs of the target audience. So what Russia is able to do is take the fringe voices in a target country, be it Colombia, be it the United States, mm -hmm. and take them from a fringe and give the full force of one of the largest information opera operations apparatuses behind them. Uh, so if you look at RT Actualidad, you look at RT in English, almost everybody on there is a native Spanish speaker, native English speaker. Uh, and those people just understand the culture. They understand the biases to play on much better than somebody who grew up in Moscow ever will. So what Russia is really able to do is to take these conspiracies that already exist, that already fit kind of the cultural uh, milieu of the target country and play on them to make sure that those conspiracies thread. Imran, is there, is there one uh, of these social media or these apps that are harder to deal with than others? I mean, is WhatsApp harder to... I mean, it would seem to me that that's the hardest place to stop misinformation. It's the hardest place to monitor, yeah. sure, but it also doesn't have the viral potential that um, something like Facebook and Twitter does, just the sheer ability to network at the, at the rapid rate. Mm -hmm. And also, one individual cannot possibly have the enormous audience that they can have on... So you view WhatsApp as, while troubling, a little safer than a Facebook or a... Uh, the, the, they all play different parts in the, in the disinformation ecosystem. And, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the middle of the market of disinformation has always been, and, and still is, Facebook. Yeah. Um, it's the place where, for zero marginal cost, you can send a message to each additional person, uh, each additional message as well. And so you're able to spread vast amounts of disinformation, just yeah. pepper people with disinformation so they can't actually tell what's true or not. Carmen, are you seeing an attempt by um, Spanish language activists or Spanish language media to counter this? Definitely, and it's mostly democratic groups that have formed uh, firms mm -hmm. uh, to counter disinformation in Spanish. Uh, Voto Latino uh, has a huge amount of money from the DNC to counter this kind of disinformation. It used and to be they wanted money from the DNC to register voters, and now they have to do this, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but as he was mentioning um, about Facebook, yeah, I remember after the elections, mm -hmm. the amount of disinformation there was in Spanish about election fraud yeah. was incredible, and nobody was taking it down. It was so so easily accessible. Ben, pretty, very quickly, but in an earlier podcast, you were saying that there's no right answer here, but that Wikipedia in some way, their system does seem to block more misinformation than most. Why? Yeah, uh, so there are a few reasons. One is what we were talking about earlier with WhatsApp um, and Telegram, and this is true for Wikipedia too. The, an algorithm isn't feeding you the information. You have to go and actively seek it. So information that's designed to just appeal to the basest emotions is going to be much more successful when there's no friction in its delivery, when it's just being brought to you. It's, it's the biggest right thing away. I've taken away from yeah. this, is that if we can build in some time, mm -hmm. build in a breath, build in time to think, then maybe we can at least cut back on some of this. Right. Anyway, you guys were terrific. Thank you so much. Up next... Russian President Vladimir Putin is threatening Wikipedia with fines if it does not delete information about the war in Ukraine. I'm going to be joined by Wikimedia CEO Mariana Iskander to discuss how an online encyclopedia, which allows anyone to edit it, does combat misinformation. Stick with us. Welcome back. She's been in the role for just three months, but already the CEO of Wikimedia it is the parent organization of Wikipedia, something you're probably quite familiar with, is facing a big crisis. The Russian president, Vladimir Putin, is threatening Wikipedia with fines if it does not delete how it characterizes the war in Ukraine, saying it's misleading Russian readers. So I asked Wikimedia CEO Mariana Iskander how she planned to deal with not only Russia, but others who will pressure the site to stop its flow of information in the future. 
if we go back to basics, Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia. It's not a place for original research in theory because the goal is that um, information is cited you know that our articles have a talk page that sits behind it. This allows the discussion, the debates, often about citations, to be radically transparent. We have a number of technology features that I think really assist in tackling misinformation as it appears. This ranges from um, kind of human-led machines that support when a citation is missing, we have editors who are vigilant about watching articles where um, controversial topics uh, may have lots and lots of changes. We see that often uh, misinformation on the most controversial of topics is corrected literally within minutes. So a number of built-in features that really try to respond to that. And in the case of um, the Russia and Ukraine articles, you know, the one article describing the invasion has over 500 citations, which is really the most important point. So if there's a, if there's a flaw that someone, that some might argue, I, that I might uh, I'll give you play devil's advocate here in your system, it would be, it is still subjective to, you know, a page, there's one person in charge of a page, right? One person can shut down a moderation at some point if they're, if they're in charge of it, can they? Not, isn't not, that right? Not necessarily. So obviously, there are people with varying levels of access that can, um, if it's necessary, limit editing on a page. That's obviously not the first prize. Um, and people who can monitor and watch it. I guess what I would say is, you know, this is um, uh, society's best answer to the increasing polarization that we see. The debates are out in the open. Citations are required. Verified sources are required. The goal is to really be um, focused on the encyclopedic content. So no doubt that there are imperfections, as there are in any system. I mean, this is a community that has a list of hoaxes on Wikipedia to point out that, of course, there are things that are going to happen. But I would say that given what we see in the world, it's sort of humanity's best effort to try to use the power of people aided by machines to do the transparent work of having those debates out in the open and really relying on verified and reliable sources. So as regulation, uh, various ways to regulate social media uh, are percolating, um, why shouldn't, should Wikipedia, are you comfortable with Wikipedia or Wikimedia essentially being regulated as a social media company? I would say that most people understand why this is an issue in the public square. The most important point that we've been really trying to make is that there are alternate models and different ways that the internet um, can serve knowledge and people's needs. I think we're really focused on ensuring certainly that policymakers and regulators see that Wikipedia is one alternate example um, that has community moderation, that has a lot of the checks and balances already in place. Again, always learning, always growing, always improving. Um, and that's really been, I think, the main focus um, that we've been trying to, to drive. Do you feel like you have enough content monitors in Spanish, enough content monitors in French? I mean, this is an open invitation for anyone to join because growing communities in every language is a goal. I would say that uh, Spanish and French are amongst the most edited. And so when you have, again, more people means uh, more perspectives, more variety. Uh, and so the goal is really to just keep adding more, even though those are amongst the largest language Wikipedias that we have. Well, it, it, you, it's a fine line you guys walk, though, because sometimes you don't want organizations involved with their own, you know, you, you seem to, the, with their own, um, I guess, perspective or their own biographies or their own entities on the organization, correct? So how do you, what, how do you distinguish that? You know, I, you know, I just, I guess, Chuck, I, I really don't see it that way. I think that the reality is that the success of what has been, frankly, you know, a wonder uh, on the internet has been the result of, um, frankly, an army of, of human beings who are invested and interested, who find ways to collaborate, who do their work out in the open, 
who are certainly supported and enabled by a set of organizations, both country chapters, certainly the Wikimedia Foundation. So this, you know, it's not about um, issues are over there and issues are over here. It's about trying to understand in a world in which institutions are all being forced to think about how to open the doors so that people can do the things that they're best placed to do and, and where they are. So I, that's how I would characterize it. All right, let me leave you with this. What keeps you up at night about Wikimedia? You know, we have to invite more of the world uh, to participate in this. The magic of this work is not that information is accessible to all, but that all are invited to contribute to the sum of human knowledge. And I think making good on that promise is something that I certainly spend a lot of nights uh, worrying about. Mariana's interview is a reminder. When it comes to fighting off misinformation, it does take a village. So if your community is tackling this in a unique way, we want to hear about it. Tweet us using hashtag MTP reports or message us on any of our social platforms. That's all we have for this episode of Meet the Press Reports. Join us the next time as we take a close look at the history of racial inequality in America's most watched sport these days, football. How the current moment may be the opportunity for change many have been looking for. Next time on Meet the Press Reports. And of course, we'll see you Sunday on Meet the Press.